Wow. Calm down, calm down. That was the most efficient calming down I've seen in some time. Thanks a lot. Uh, so my name is uh, Matt Parker. I will be your host for this uh, Science as Vital as Ever uh, rally. So I will, I will appear between the speakers. I'll make sure everything's under control. I'll make sure you're all perfectly happy. Uh, and uh, hopefully the evening will run nice and smoothly. As you may have noticed on the way in, uh, this event is all about convincing people that spending money on science research is absolutely worthwhile. So... Very, very quickly, can I get a cheer from everyone who didn't die before their first birthday? I'd like to thank you all for coming to the Sciences Vital Rally. Uh, well, no, there's more. Uh, so, uh, obvi obviously, a lot of people in the room, we are all entirely convinced that science funding is uh, completely worthwhile to do. Uh, but we need to make sure we safeguard that and avoid any possible cuts, such as the 40% uh, cut, which is being uh, threatened. So what we have done is we have compiled a fantastic string of uh, speakers, uh, experts, everything from uh, science researchers to experts in policy, right through to science communication, uh, quote, unquote, celebrities. And so uh, they will come out and uh, we're basically going to uh, throw as many speakers at you as possible. This is uh, simultaneously being live streamed to the internet. So We'll be watching this but in much less resolution than you're currently enjoying. Uh, we have uh, at a bare minimum there are gatherings currently in Glasgow, York, Newcastle and Swansea who are watching and playing along at home. Uh, so we will at uh, at least two points during this evening we're going to uh, get some tweets and videos from them and put them up on the screen. Uh, there will also be a uh, interval approximately half the way. I mean it's tiny. Uh, but we will give you a chance to get out and have a very quick break uh, if you desperately require the bathroom. Uh, and then uh, we're back in again. And hypothetically, the entire thing will wrap up before 9 o'clock. So we should be absolutely fine. Uh, so, oh, my name is Matt Parker. For people who haven't met me uh, before, I, I'm a mathematician by trade. Uh, so, um, so officially, while I agree that science is indeed vital, my, my proper line is, let's see you do it without some maths. But, yes, uh, you, I'm, uh, did someone hiss? Wow, that's, that's one way to turn an audience on you. Um, hi, I'm the logical foundation for everything you do. Anyway, so, uh, uh, so again, I think uh, science is absolutely fantastic. I actually, I work, I am the public engagement in mathematics uh, fellow at Queen Mary uh, University of London, whereas I used to be a maths teacher and I spend as much of my time as possible trying to convince more people to get more excited about mathematics. And obviously I have a huge soft spot for science and so I'm very keen to see uh, this rally succeed. I will also several times throughout the evening mention there are postcards floating around. You may have seen them on your seats. In fact, there are prizes that will relate to those uh, later on, and we are encouraging people to send their own. You can go online, you can fill in a postcard uh, as a virtual entity. It will then be turned into a physical item and sent off to George Osborne, but that will be mentioned uh, again. Okay, so I think we are ready to go uh, racing into the evening properly. So we're going to start with, uh, to explain again why we are here and what we're going to be doing, we have the chair from the Science is Vital campaign. Can you please put your hands together? Welcome to the stage, Dr. Jenny Roan. Welcome everybody to Conway Hall. I'm so pleased to see you all here today. I just thought I'd spend a minute or two, I don't want to bore you, because we have such a great lineup of speakers. But I just wanted to tell you a little bit about what we are and why we're here. So Science is Vital is a grassroots campaigning group composed of scientists and people who just think science is important. So not just scientists, but we do have an awful lot of scientists on our books. We formed in 2010 as a direct response to the government's threatened cuts of up to 40%, which sounds a little bit familiar. Uh, and then we mobilized in four short weeks, had a beautiful rally of several thousand people in front of the treasury. Was anybody there? Yay, Yay. excellent, okay. And ultimately, as you probably know, uh, thanks to our efforts, but also the efforts of many, many other groups that synergized together, we managed to get the so-called flat cash settlement, which meant science was not cut, but it was also not invested in. So 
that was a victory of sorts, but in some ways not a victory, because five years on, we are feeling the effects of that flat cash settlement, which has been basically a cut in real terms. So five years later, we're hearing exactly the same message from government. There's a comprehensive spending review coming up in November. They're mooting the possibility of cuts of up to 40%. The rumors that we've heard coming out of government are not good. We've heard anywhere from you might get flat, flat cash if you're lucky. There probably will be some sort of cut. So we're here today because we don't want that to happen. OK, so we've reignited the campaign. Um, and basically, our message is science is vital for the economy. It delivers a robust return on investment. To cut science when you want to raise money for your country makes absolutely no sense. And I'm sure I don't need to convince this, this audience. But if we cut science, research will suffer. The economy will suffer. Great scientists will leave the UK for better shores, uh, and we will struggle to attract the talent that we need to attract to this country. And we'll hear tonight from a few people who have come from other countries because they wanted to work in a great country for science, which the UK currently is, but may not be in the future if this carries on. So what we're doing tonight, what are we doing here? <laughs> we're having a rally to celebrate science, to send a strong message to government that science is vital for the UK economy, that it's important. We need investment in science, not cuts. It's very important. And this action is synergizing with a lot of online things that we're doing. You've probably seen our tweets. And most importantly, I guess, the postcards. We've had a, an amazing response. We have more than 1,000 postcards have been generated through our online widget. Those cards on your chairs, by the way, please fill them out and leave them in the back when you leave. And we will include that in the big pile. And these are all supposed to be addressed to George Osborne, telling him why you think science is important, your personal take. Okay, so that's basically why we're here. I'm really glad to see you all, and I hope you have a great time tonight. Without further ado, let's get on with the great lineup of speakers. All right, in descending order of the position within Science is Vital, we have one of the vice chairs uh, who will be talking to us uh, about the actual spending on science research and to put that slightly into context for us. He used to be a physicist but has now become a computational biologist. Uh, can you please put your hands together for Dr. Andrew Steele? As Matt said, I'm Andrew, and by day, I'm a computational biologist, but by night, I like to make sense of the multitudinous millions that the media misrepresent about our money. And this all came about because a few years ago, I got a bit obsessed with government spending, and it turned out that when I drilled down, when I got those figures onto a scale that I could understand, I was shocked by how little we spend on science. So to kick off this evidence-based evening, I'd like to give you a bit of a tour of UK research funding. And as good a place to start as any is health. Um, if you want to get a slightly morbid handle on health, you can look at what kills us. So imagine that we've got these are 10 average people in the UK. What are they going to die of? Well, cancer kills about a third of us, and yet we spend just £2.80 per person per year on public funded cancer research. Now, if there's a disease with a 30% chance of killing me, I want to spend more than three quid a year trying to work out why and maybe how to stop it. But that's actually the, one of the best funded conditions. If we were to look at, say, heart disease, that kills 15% of us. We spend £1.20 per person per year on government-funded heart disease research. Stroke kills 10% of people, and we spend just 69 pence per person per year researching it. In fact, not to be patronising, but that is a picture of 69 pence. That's your entire annual contribution to researching stroke. Frankly, it'd be pretty insulting to leave that as a tip in a restaurant, let alone your contribution to researching a disease that kills 10% of people, possibly including the waiter you just insulted. And this is a problem that recurs across science. Whether you look at health or energy or basic research, the amounts that we spend on research are dwarfed by the scale of the problems that science is trying to solve. So let's take a step away from health and look at how much we spend on basic science, particle physics, the Large Hadron Collider. That's the place we discovered the Higgs boson a couple of years ago. And it's often cited as a very expensive piece of scientific research. It costs £2.6 billion to build a 26-kilometre-long ring underneath the Swiss countryside in which we accelerate protons to 99.999999% the speed of light. Now, we might compare that, for example, to Crossrail. For £15 billion, pounds, we're going to get 21 kilometres of tunnel in which we accelerate trains to 0.00001% the speed of light. <laughs> So 
So even compared to fairly everyday bits of government infrastructure spending, science looks cheap. How's about nuclear fusion? I'm an ex-physicist, so I've got a bit of a soft spot for this particular kind of energy research. And we think it's going to cost somewhere in the region of £60 billion to go from the experimental reactors we have now to putting fully functioning, near-infinite, clean energy on the power grids of the world. Now, that does sound like a lot of money, until you compare it to the £120 billion that Apple made in revenue on the iPhone, and that's just between 2007 and 2012. And bad news, iPhone owners, over half of that was profit which means that Apple could single-handedly have developed nuclear fusion using just the profits on a single product line. Instead, they developed a big iPhone, <laughs> a smaller big iPhone, and most recently, a big version of their small iPhone that comes in a variety of different colors. Now, that's pretty innovative, I'm sure you'll agree, but it's not quite nuclear fusion. Actually, on the other side of the coin, maybe it's a good thing that Apple didn't sink their entire iPhone properties into developing the iTokamak fusion reactor, because if they had, you could probably only get the power out with an expensive proprietary non-standard cable, and even then, only if you had an iTunes account. <laughs> so those numbers, they're big, they boggled my mind. Let's go back to some of those pounds per person per year amounts that we said the government spends on health research, and let's try and compare them to some items of personal spending. Let's look at how much we spend per person per year in the UK on alcohol. It's about £600 per person per year, and that's every man, woman and child, so you've got to hope that some of them aren't drinking. Now, I don't want a world where there's no alcohol, but there's loads more science. That would be a pretty dull place to live. But if you look at this graph, we spend £600 a year on booze and less than three quid a year trying to research a disease that kills 10% of us. It just doesn't make any sense. Something else that doesn't make any sense. Weddings. We spend £160 per person per year getting married in the UK. And in fact, if you take the cost of the average wedding and divide it by the length of the average marriage, you get over £700 a year, which just dwarfs anything that we spend on science. Finally, loo roll. We spend £17 per person per year on average on toilet paper here in the UK. And now, I don't want a world where there's no loo roll, but there's 10% more science. I value having a clean bum. But equally, I'm not sure that I'm 100% efficient with my toilet paper. I reckon I could cut back by 10% if I really tried. And if I did, that would give me £1.70 a year to play with. I could almost triple what we spend researching heart disease. I could almost quadruple what we spend researching stroke. And I think once this slide starts to look a bit less ridiculous, we're finally getting somewhere with science funding. So in light of these numbers, I'm just astounded that the government is considering either continuing or accelerating the decline in UK investment in research. So throughout this evening, as you're listening to all the different talks and stories, I want you to bear in mind, not only science is vital, but also science is startlingly cheap. If you want to find out a little bit more, if you like those statistics, enjoyed them, maybe enjoyed is the wrong word, but you can find more of them on scienceagram.org or follow us on Twitter at scienceagram. Thank you. Dr. Andrew Steele, ladies and gentlemen. So if you take home one message, it's please use 10% less toilet paper. Okay, so up next with our opening keynote speech uh, from the University of, sorry, he is both the Professor of Physics and later Professor of Science Communication. Can you please put your hands together for Professor Jim Marcolelli. Thank you very much, Matt. Well, good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Um, so I guess after that, Andrew tells you the jokes, we'll probably should get a bit serious. Um, it is a real pleasure to, uh, to be asked to kick off uh, this evening's proceedings, uh, and I'd first like to thank, on behalf of the UK science community, express my gratitude to, to Jenny Roan, Science is Vital, uh, Stephen Curry, Andrew Steele, and, and the rest of the team. Uh, they are really doing a great job. Um, one of the reasons why we feel that the current campaign, Science as Vital as Ever, is even more important than the one held back in 2010 is because it seems harder this time round to generate, certainly generate media interest. We held a press briefing this morning at the Science Media Center uh, to which just one journalist turned up. So, and yet for us scientists, uh, it's more urgent than ever that we get uh, the message across. Back in 2010, uh, the STEM community made the case to, that in order to rebuild the economy, we had to invest more, not less, in science. We didn't get everything we wanted, of course. Uh, we saw big cuts in a lot of fundamental research, certainly in my area, nuclear particle physics, astronomy. Um, but the flat cash deal, I think, was better than a lot of people expected. 
uh, or certainly be better than a lot of people feared. Um, we also, I think back then we had a science minister that uh, uh, David Willits, who many feel did an excellent job in fighting the corner for science in the treasury in the face of uh, dramatic and drastic um, public spending cuts elsewhere. Um, it would now appear that many of the arguments we were using back in 2010 um, are being thrown back at us by politicians. Many in government are saying, listen, we get it. You know, we, we, we can see the importance of R&D spending uh, and the need to invest in science and technology. I'll, I'll give you a few quotes. Here's the Prime Minister in 2014. We are on the brink of an industrial revolution. I want the UK to lead it. Or the Chancellor of, Ex of the Exchequer. If Britain is to become the best place to do science and apply it, we have to give British science the funding it needs in the long term. We often hear the message now that, yes, to ensure economic prosperity, a happier, healthier uh, population, we need to invest more in R&D. The Chancellor has even made it clear uh, uh, made clear his intent to prioritise spending in areas that drive productivity and growth. How could he not? I mean, there's absolutely clear and robust evidence that investment in R&D is linked to national productivity. Even the Conservative Party manifesto before the last election spoke proudly of how the science budget had been relatively protected from cuts in the last parliament. But how far are these mollifying words from reality? Last year, a biz analysis suggested that the UK should aim to spend 2.9% of its GDP on R&D. That is about average, that figure, for our competitors. But it's over a whopping 70% more than the UK spends at the moment. And of course, when we talk about that, that the 1.6 or so percent that the UK currently invests in R&D, I don't just mean government spending. I mean, and we're including industry, higher education, um, non-profit, overseas funding as well. So how much does the UK government spend on science and technology R&D? Less than half a percent, way below the rest of the developed world. Now, we don't have the natural resources or the, or the cheap labor market enjoyed by some countries, but we have always prided ourselves in having a highly skilled workforce uh, and leading the global knowledge economy. But even here, we're suffering. Do you know that one in five of the UK workforce, workforce is employed in science and engineering roles? And yet, we have an annual shortfall of 40,000 new skilled STEM workers. In fact, we need to double the number of engineering graduates alone by 2020 if we are to meet demand. A good example, close to my heart, is the plans to invest in nuclear new build. Hinkley Point Power Station, which has been in the news recently, will be built by a French-Chinese consortium. Yes, it will be a big employer in the region, but we have to ask why we can't build our own new power stations. Part of the answer is simply that we don't have sufficient trained scientists and engineers to go it alone. Now, this is particularly relevant for my field uh, of academic nuclear physics research. We're publicly funded by one of the research councils, STFC, uh, which also supports research in astronomy and particle physics. Our work is mostly fundamental science, blue sky research. We're studying the structure of matter, the evolution of stars, where all the atoms in the universe are made of. But my research group at the University of Surrey, one of the largest uh, in nuclear physics in the UK, also plays a role in training the next generation of nuclear physicists. So while undergraduate physics at the moment is going through a bit of a boom period, uh, we, we don't, despite having the, the large numbers of undergraduates, we don't have the funding to retain the very best students to continue on into postgraduate research. So it seems crazy that at a time when the UK is committed to investing in new nuclear power, it's not investing sufficiently in training the young nuclear scientists and engineers. And yet, we're told we have the most efficient research base in the world, something to be proud of. The UK has 4% of the world's researchers, and yet we produce four times that, 16% of the world's most highly cited research papers. Oh, and this is with just over 3% of global expenditure on research. So you might argue, what are you moaning about? Keep up the good work. This is proof that the UK is the best place in the world to do the best science. 
but, and it's a really important but, outputs and performance in science and innovation are linked to prior investments, sometimes 10 years, 20 years, 30 years prior. So this argument that current excellence is due to current investment is just plain wrong. Continuing to erode the science budget is already starting to catch up with us. We're, as you, you're hearing, in the sixth year of a flat cash settlement of about 4.6 billion pounds, this hasn't increased to match inflation. CASE, the Campaign for Science and Engineering, which I'm a board member of, has calculated that the cumulative erosion of this ring-fenced science budget is over £1 billion. There have been savings, there have been belt tightening, there's been efficiency drives, but these come, where no, come nowhere near uh, making up for this shortfall of £1 billion. So if we are to have a flat cash settlement again, which is far from ideal, it has to be increased. Government may say the right words and dress up the numbers, but the reality, when this is all unpicked, is that we're likely to be worse off than we were five years ago. I'll quote the Chancellor in ending. I'll quote the Chancellor's words again. If Britain is to become the best place to do science, we must give it the funding it needs for the long term. Let's hope George Osborne sees the sense of these words and acts to ensure science remains vibrant in this country. Among far too many in Parliament who are scientifically illiterate, anti-science in their views, or just suspicious of science, I still think the Chancellor is an ally in our cause. I hope he doesn't let us down. Thank you very much. Professor Jim McAuley, ladies and gentlemen. We can, we can only hope. So, up next from the University of Sussex, we have a Professor of Science and Democracy. Can you please put your hands together for Professor James Wilsden. Thanks, Matt. Um, I'm here primarily uh, wearing my hat as chair of the Campaign for Social Science. Uh, and on behalf of all my fellow social scientists, uh, it's a pleasure, it's a privilege to be here, uh, to be able to stand shoulder to shoulder with our friends and colleagues uh, across the STEM disciplines uh, and to add our voice to the chorus uh, at tonight's rally. To that, there are two very simple points that I want to add. Uh, the first is a plea for unity. Uh, and here I'd like to quote from an essay written uh, at the time of the last spending review back in 2010 uh, by Lisa Jardine, whose uh, untimely death many of us are mourning today, in remarks which reflect the, the generosity of scholarship and of, and of spirit for which uh, Lisa was so well known. Uh, she said this, uh, in straitened times, it's not inevitable that arts, humanities, natural and social sciences should retreat into their separate silos. United we stand, building towards future prosperity and continuing intellectual distinction for Britain. Divided, we surely inevitably fall. And I think Lisa's work, words speak very powerfully to the uh, situation we now find ourselves in, where uh, the uncertainties of the spending review, uh, the prospect of ever tighter austerity, uh, and the upheaval of uh, potential reorganization of the research system can so easily end up pitting discipline against discipline, researcher against researcher, in a zero-sum battle for resources. In that situation, the only winners uh, are the cost cutters, uh, the, the apostles of austerity. Uh, so united we do stand, divided we surely inevitably fall. And my second point is to call uh, on us as a community to demonstrate a level of political savvy and sophistication in the way we respond to developments over the coming weeks. Of course, the size and shape of the spending review settlement matters and matters hugely. But we know that government also plans major changes to the way we organize and allocate that funding. Uh, and we, as a community, need to be on top of all of the detail in that discussion. We need to ensure that the things that matter most, uh, that are most precious uh, in the research community, aren't lost by accident uh, or by design. In my uh, spare time, and I'm not teaching science policy down at Sussex, uh, I'm part of the team that runs the science policy blog uh, on The Guardian. And, Back in July, it was our blog that first revealed the existence of the McKinsey Review uh, that Sajid Javid had uh, commissioned to look at uh, the future of, of biz funding bodies. I, I would expect a pantomime boo when I mention the McKinsey Review. Uh, 
Uh, and earlier this month, it was, it was us again who leaked the contents of the Biz 2020 plan, uh, which uh, sets out uh, the intention to cull at least half of all of the Biz-funded bodies, including the Research Councils, Hefke, and Innovate UK. Uh, so there's a huge amount at stake right now beyond uh, just the headline number, and I think we need to track all of that very carefully, uh, look at the headline numbers, but also look beyond them uh, to what's going on behind in the detail of the system. Uh, we need to make sure that uh, while a debate about restructuring is, of course, legitimate, and I mean, any government can ask those questions, uh, we need to ensure that in whatever now happens to the system, uh, that the things that survive intact include uh, our capacity to fund uh, bottom-up discovery research, uh, include our capacity to support the next generation of early career researchers, uh, and include uh, our ability to remain at the forefront, not just of uh, the natural sciences and engineering, but also uh, of the social sciences and humanities. So we in the social sciences, we in the Campaign for Social Science, stand alongside all of you. Uh, we'll do our bit uh, to add our voice to the chorus that we're all bringing here today, and I hope that that collective voice is heard. Thank you. Professor James Wilson, ladies and gentlemen. I am very proud of your restraint at no pantomime booing thus far. I hope that continues because we have a former member of parliament, so going right across all the various uh, sections that are involved in this debate over spending, we've got someone who was right in the thick of it. They are now a lecturer of science policy at the University of Cambridge. Can you please put your hands together for Dr. Julian Huppert. Thank you. Thank you, and it's great to see so many of you here. And Cambridge has a tradition of having scientists and politicians. There's one you may have heard of called Isaac Newton. Uh, anyone heard of him? Remarkably, really, because he only actually spoke once while he was an MP representing Cambridge University. He then went on, he was, he was the first uh, 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 scientist to really make money when he became master of the mint. So maybe he could persuade George Osborne that it matters. But the point is that nobody knew what his work was going to lead to. Nobody at the time could possibly have predicted that we'd still be talking about him and what he would do. You just can't tell. But that's why it's important for us to make that case for science and for research for the longer term. Now, we know that it's fun. We know that science is creative. We know that knowledge is worthwhile for its own sake and that what we do can change the world. We also know that science makes money and that it's essential for our future as a country. What are we going to be doing? How will we earn our way in the world in 10, 20, 50 years if it's not based on the knowledge that we're developing now? I don't know what it will be, but it's not just long term either. Investment in science and research helps productivity now, with the skills that we need now, with our health now. Without money, all of that will struggle. Now, we're used to getting a buy in this country with, with often very little. Rutherford famously said, we haven't got any money, so we'll have to think. But you can't keep doing that. You can't continue. People will leave. They'll leave science. They'll leave the UK. If you cut a bit more, you will harm a huge amount. We need that funding. Now, it's not just about funding, as you all know. It's about having an immigration policy which doesn't drive people away at the borders. It's about having an education system which makes sure we train people to have the skills that are needed. It's about inclusion. So we don't lose talent because of people's gender, ethnicity, or location. And in, science is fundamentally an international thing. We're better off inside the European Union, working with Europe, than we are outside. All of this matters, but cash also matters. In my time as a Member of Parliament, I pushed the idea of a 15-year settlement of above inflation increases every year. And I tried to get agreement between the other parties. And I'm sorry, I failed. I could not get them to agree to do that. And we as a community failed because we didn't make science an election issue. Hands up who here voted largely based on science policy issues? I see a handful of ha hands and I recognize most of you. <laughs> and that makes a difference. Labour didn't commit to it, the Conservatives didn't. We did as Lib Dems, but that's partly because I wrote that bit. <laughs> and, and it wasn't exactly the best outcome for us at all. I don't think it was ca causal, even if it was correlated. I believe in evolution, and you need selective pressures. If we don't put a selective pressure on politicians, if we don't put a selective pressure on ministers, 
we don't get there. So we have to create that pressure and keep that pressure up. And that's why we're all here today, to try to let everyone know that science is vital, that research is vital. And you have to let George Osborne know that it matters and you will pay attention to what happens. You have to let your MP know that it matters and you will pay attention to what happens and it will affect your vote. You have to let your friends know that they should do all of this and tell their friends. If we can get that right, then we can really make a difference now. We have to keep the pressure going year after year after year or else you'll have to come again in five years and hear me speak again. Thank you very much. Thank you, Julian Huppets. Uh, fun fact, Julian was one of the few uh, scientific early trained members of Parliament and uh, very good advice from someone inside the machine we are trying to influence. Please do let your local MPs know there is a political cost for not supporting science. And if you're playing at home, he is the current winner of Best Joke of the Rally with Isaac Newton was the first scientist to really make money when he ran the mint. So up, up next, a uh, very well-known author and broadcaster as well as founder of the Good Thinking Society, which is directly involved in this evening's rally. Can you please put your hands together for Dr. Simon Singh? Um, great. I wasn't expecting that, but that's okay. Um, we just check. Have we got the slides? Can I, can I, can I control that? You, uh, only if you ask Lee very okay, nicely. Lee, Lee, Lee. Let, that's fine. That's fine. We'll go with it. Um, yeah. So, okay. So, um, I wanted to talk about something completely different, but I'll talk about this. Um, <laughs> and uh, we'll start off, Lee. If you can hit the, the, the black circle of the green speaker and just play that for five seconds. Great. We all know that song, it's Led Zeppelin's Stairway to Heaven. Hit, stop. That's great. Um, so what I'm now going to do, just bear with me, this will all make sense in, in four and a half minutes. Um, if you hit the, um, the I'm going to play it to you backwards now, Led Zeppelin's Stairway to Heaven, but backwards. So if you hit the red speaker black button, thank you very much, Lee. Last about 10 seconds, have a listen to it, see what you make of it. Okay, so here's the question. Um, um, hands up if you heard the word Satan in there. Okay, about a dozen people here, a few people there, a few people on the balcony, great. Okay, that's good. A um, few people heard the word Satan, but hands up if you heard the words, uh, if we can hit the reveal R, please, Lee. Um, here's to my sweet Satan, the one whose little path would make me sad, whose power is Satan. Oh, he'll give you, he'll give you 666. There was a little tool shed where he made us suffer, sad Satan. Hands up if you heard all of that. <laughs> just, just me. Um, right. Um, now, Adam, Adam, Adam Rutherford's at the back saying, because you, you, you've seen me talk, do this demo before, so you did hear those words, and that's really important, because you can testify that I'm not, gonna, I'm not cheating here, because what I'm going to do now is I'm going to play this to you again, Led Zeppelin, Stairway to Heaven backwards, and this time, everyone in the room is going to hear every single one of these words, okay? And two promises, first promise is, I am not cheating. Uh, this is exactly the same sound file you've just heard, and Adam can testify to that. Second promise, you are going to hear every single one of these words. So if we can hit the reverse, you've got it, Lee. Here we go. Fingers crossed. Hands up if you heard it that time, yeah? Great, great. So, so I find this truly shocking. I play it to you the first time and most people hear nothing at all. I play it to you a second time and I think pretty much everyone in the room heard an entire coherent paragraph about Satan and his tool shed. Um, <laughs> so what's going on? Um, well, all that's happening is that um, it's the power of suggestion, okay? Um, those words are not there. 
but, but I flashed them up. I said, you will hear the words. I lit them up one by one. And your brain, our brains, have evolved over the course of a million years to, to find patterns, to find meaning around us. So if we hear something that vaguely sounds like the words we're expecting, our brains trick us into hearing something that's not there. And that's what just happens. Your brains tricked you into hearing something that's not there. Now, sometimes our brains can trick us into seeing something that's not there. Sometimes our brains can trick us trick us into believing something that's not true. And for me, that's why science is really vital. Um, because without science, all we have is our five senses, and they can clearly mislead us. We just have what other people tell us, uh, what people in authority tell us, and so on, our own prejudices. And so we need to step back. We need to be objective. We need to use math and science and technology. I've just been in America for a week. I shouldn't say math. I meant mathematics or maths. Um, we need mathematics, we need science, we need, te need technology, we need observation, we need objectivity uh, in order to get to the real truth. And when we apply science and technology in this way, we can do extraordinary things. And that, for me, is why science is vital. Thank you very much. So you officially heard it here first. Simon Singh encourages you to use subliminal messages to convince members of parliament to fund science. <laughs> What's he going to do? Sue me for libel? Okay, so... Uh, uh, <laughs> Uh, technically, it's slander because I'm talking. I suspect there are pedants in the audience. Uh, okay, now in a moment, we are going to have a, another uh, quick entertainment uh, break. But I want to point out before that happens, there are postcards on your seats. So they are all different. You should have your own uh, unique postcard that's been put on there. These have all been genuinely filled out by members of the public who have gone onto the Science is Vital website. They have typed in their message. Uh, Science is Vital have then printed them out and they they are sending in all the copies to George Osborne. You can either use one of their set images on the website, or you can upload your own preferably not hilariously rude image, and they will print that on the reverse side. And so these are examples that they have run off. I have been told that if you can find the postcards which were written by Jenny Roan, who is the chair of Science is Vital, Andrew Steele or Stephen Curry, the two uh, vice chairs, or uh, Simon Singh, who you just saw, those four postcards are in the mix, and I've been told there's uh, up between zero and one free can of beer available for anyone who can hand those in. Uh, so uh, see Shane. He's got a, a badge that says Shane. Uh, he's the one who said he'll hand I assume he's just got them in a plastic bag somewhere and he'll give them to you. Uh, so if you have got anyone from... Oh, they're at the back. They're in a... Oh, it's Stella fresh from the box, guys. Uh, so who, who is it who's got it? What, what's, oh, they're right, right by the door. Okay, right. So if you can find a... Postcard from Ginny Roan, Andrew Steele, Stephen Curry, or Simon Singh. You may exchange it for your choice of any of the beverages in that box. Spoiler alert, they're all stellar. Okay, so up, now up next is a fantastic performer. And obviously it would be a huge uh, misuse of the fantastic privilege I have been given to come out here and host the Science is Vital uh, rally if I promoted things that I am doing that would be entirely appropriate. However, I can say that your next speaker is, uh, she's a member of Festival of the Spoken Nerd, uh, who's currently on tour with their fantastic, I mean, hilarious show, Just for Graphs. I cannot over-recommend it enough. Uh, she will be coming out to uh, perform uh, one of the songs from that show. So can you please put your hands together for Helen Arney. Thank you very much. Thank you, Matt. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, can we have a round of applause for uh, both the compare of tonight and the uh, another third of Festival of the Spoken Nerd? Ladies and gentlemen, Matt Parker. <laughs> yes. So for me, science research doesn't just appeal to your brains or, like we've heard, to your bank balances. Uh, science research, I believe, appeals to your, to your heart, to your emotions, and that's one of the reasons we do it. And I have a song about a piece of research, a long-running piece of research that came to fruition last year. Ladies and gentlemen, this, if this does not touch your heart, I have no idea what will. You left this earth ten years ago. 
in search of distant comet and last november's headline news was that you landed on it but we knew that there was something wrong when we saw your battery but thank newton you weren't running any eye technology so now i sing a lullaby and i dedicate to thee the bravest little fridge-sized probe in all the galaxy sleep well little filet you've fulfilled your destiny four billion miles on the clock to do a science on a rock your jump down from rosetta it was so good you jumped again and again we low gravity but when you came to land it wasn't quite what isa planned so you deployed the best Thank you. So you deployed the best of technology from 2004. But that didn't stop you getting all the data you went for. The newsrooms of the BBC resounded with the echo of presenters wrestling with these words. Chirima, chimini, chim, chimini, chim, chim, chimini, Gary Lineker, Menko. Nailed it. We watched with rising horror as your batteries ran cold Your solar panels, it turns out, don't work so well down a hole Now the only true space cowboys are Jamiroquai and you And maybe Bruce Willis too It's a miracle you woke up when the sun came in too So sleep well, little filet, you fulfilled your destiny. You rocked that rock, and that's how you roll on Comet 67P. Now, not me, ladies and gentlemen. Wow. And Helen has just spent the last five nights on tour, so I can only imagine how tired she is right now. Uh, so, oh, Festival of the Spoken Nerds. Uh, if you want to go and see them, they're on tour right now. Uh, you can just Google them, you'll find the details. Frankly, if you can't find us on Google, we don't want you at the shows anyway. So, uh, okay, we're now going to attempt to do uh, some live, this is going to go horribly wrong, live link-ups with the other science, uh, no, yes, yes. Oh, okay, right, I'm getting a variety of hand signals from the tech booth, so we'll see what happens. People have been gathering in other cities to watch uh, the stream and to uh, join in, in in the comfort of somewhere else. And so we asked them to tweet about it and to take videos. So they will have been uh, taking photographs as well. Uh, so, I mean, I just, he just did the hand symbol for either they've been taking photos or really short videos. So I'm not sure which it's going to be. Uh, so we'll see what we can bring up on the screen. So, oh, here we go. Right, so York. I mean, it's a double thumbs up kind of evening in York, as you can see there. Uh, they don't just have terrible pool tables in York. There is a distortion because of the wraparound photograph. Uh, so there you are. Have we got Newcastle have gone all out on the decor at their event. <laughs> so they're actively watching. They are actively watching. That is the most active watching I've seen in my life. That is absolutely fantastic. Okay, people in Glasgow are just drinking. Oh, an engrossed bunch of concerned scientists. Oh, there you are. So they're having a great time in Glasgow. And the people in Swansea couldn't be bothered. So, uh, <laughs> oh, here we go. Here we go. I think we all enjoyed reading that in our heads. Uh, so, 
<laughs> Have we got any more tweets? Oh, here we go. All right. So, let Simon sing. Catch you. Oh, there you are. Good. We do want you to read the whole thing. First half is fine. Uh, it comes out with rousing applause. Well, speak for yourself, to be entirely honest. Uh, don't forget to ask George Osborne. I do that. The end. So, <laughs> we're going to get angry tweets from Swansea now. Anyway, right, so uh, we're going to do, uh, please, if you are here, you are welcome to tweet uh, during uh, the rally. There will be an interval in a moment. We have two more uh, fantastic speakers who are going to come out, and there will be an interval. So if you are uncomfortable with using your phone while people are talking at you, then you can wait until that to send some tweets, or you can send them now during the show. We won't uh, confiscate your phones. The hashtag, as you saw, was science is vital. Okay, so up next, we have a developmental psychologist from UCL. Uh, can you please put your hands together for the absolutely fantastic... Fantastic. Prof Professor Uta Frith. So about 50 years ago, I came to this country as a student. My main aim was to learn English so that I could do research in clinical psychology. And I had heard of the innovative approaches to treatment of psychiatric conditions that were just then being developed in London. Indeed, these approaches referred uh, to as behavior therapy were a break with traditional talking cures. They went on to revolutionize clinical practice all over the world and modern versions of behavior therapy, CBT, mindfulness training, they are making a real difference to the treatment of the many different forms of mental illness. So I did an internship at the Institute of Psychiatry, where this was all being developed. It was an exhilarating experience. But I had planned to return to Germany. I had already packed my suitcase and already sent a parcel full of books and papers back home. And I had already registered for the next course at my home university. I paid my dues. I'd mapped out the thesis I was going to write. And then it turned out all very different from what I had planned. Everything changed when, amazingly, I was offered an opportunity to do postgraduate training in clinical psychology. And this was what I really, really wanted to do, more than anything in the world. And during this training, I came into contact with autism for the first time, and that started a lifelong fascination. But at the same time, it was also a love story because I met my future husband and we have been together ever since. This makes it 50 years. Autism is one of those mental disorders that people in the 50s and 60s thought had no organic basis. Instead, they thought it was caused by psychogenic factors, meaning a disturbed sort of mother-child relationship. This idea, rooted in psychoanalysis, had taken a deep hold and it heaped horrible misery to mothers and families, blaming them for the disorder. And I believe it was mainly due to British researchers that this idea was overturned. And I'm extremely proud that I was able to play a role in this. And I'm forever grateful to the Medical Research Council for having funded uh, this research. To me as a foreigner, the attraction of living in this country was not the physical environment nor the cultural things like music and art and education. I was actually convinced that other European countries uh, equaled or surpassed the UK in many of these aspects. Nobody in those days said they uh, uh, would come for the weather or for the food or <laughs> that they could get rich. However, there was one public good which I believe has never ever been surpassed elsewhere and that is the culture of science. And this is what made my decision to stay so very easy. The scientists around me were most welcoming. Many were foreigners like me. I felt at home. 
So I hope my personal story can contribute to the conclusion that we all share. Science is the greatest good this country has offered for decades now. It has created a culture that is unique and the envy of the world, and it's produced the nourishing environment that has led to amazing discoveries, inventions, innovations. So what about the future? As a neuroscientist, I believe the time is right to embark on an exploration of the mind, and it will be a more amazing journey than any space odyssey. It's time to dig deeper into the secrets of development and aging into our social nature. And there is a very practical reason for this research. Because if we understand the process that could go wrong in the mind, then we can find better treatments for mental disorders and mental disability. But even more important, it will help us to understand how we can work together better and how we can make better decisions. Thank you. Professor Uta Freeth, ladies and gentlemen. I mean, I mean, that's it. If we have more science funding, we attract more people like Uta. That's the best argument I have heard so far. Uh, for the record, I did come here for the weather. So. Uh, up next, uh, Jim has already mentioned CASE, the Campaign for Science and uh, Engineering. We are now very honoured to have their director here to talk to us. Can you please welcome to the stage, Naomi Weir. Thank you, and good evening. Now, you've done some excellent clapping, which is very kind. Um, I just wonder, there seems to be a lot of people out here who probably have a lot of good things to say about why science is really vital. And obviously, you've been able to do some of it through Twitter. You've been able to do some of it online. But you have actually made your way here. So I thought it might be quite nice, perhaps, not to hear from me for the first minute, perhaps. So I don't know if anyone out here has a really loud voice and an opinion on why science is vital. Anyone? Oh, no. That is a real shame. No one has an opinion on why science... Pardon? It's meaningful. It's meaningful. Thank you. Anyone else? Knowledge is beautiful. Thank you. Anyone else? It makes things better. It makes things better. It's fun. It's safer than financial markets. It's safer than financial markets. That's the stuff that gets the crowd going. That, that's what we need. <laughs> Wonderful. Anything else? That, you know, evolutionary nature. There we go. Perfect. Thank you very much. A bit of audience participation is welcome, so please do keep it coming. Um, boos, hisses, preferably once I'm gone would be a delight. Um, so, uh, as you heard, I have the privilege and responsibility of being director of CASE this year, the Campaign for Science and Engineering. Uh, not much has been happening politically during 2015, um, so it's been quite a quiet year for us. Um, so obviously still to come, well, there's a bit to go. We've been hearing about the spending review settlement, 26th of November. We'll see what's happened, the fallout from the 25th. Um, but we clearly all think science is vital, although I have to say you were slightly slow in um, being forthcoming with your reasons as to why you think science is vital. But um, that's why we're all here. And I guess the question then is that I've been tasked with talking to you a little bit about is what about those people who are setting the tone, the people who are taking the decisions that actually impact on the funding settlement for science? What do they think? The political context within which these decisions about science funding and the structures, as we've heard before, for science funding, what, what, what are their views? Do they think science is really vital? Um, we heard from Jim earlier some quotes back to us that I feel some of them we could have written ourselves, uh, that science needs the funding for the long term if it's going to do what uh, it needs to do. Um, but do they really understand that science is vital? Now, um, one of the things I enjoy most about working at CASE, other than obviously things like this, which are a delight, but hopefully we won't need many more of them, but um, is the wonderful variety of my job. So I could be digging into a data set, looking at the woefully low uh, amount of money that this government spends on R&D. Um, I could be writing a comment piece for a paper about immigration. As we heard from Julian, it's all part of the package. Um, I could be meeting with members across the science and engineering community, perhaps including some of you, to hear about actually what it's like on the ground as a scientist or engineer. How is policy and funding working out for you? Um, and then the other bit is then seeking to meet with and influence those who do have the power to make decisions over 
how science is funded and organised. Um, and in fact, my last meeting before coming here, uh, rather timely, was with the science minister, with Joe Johnson, uh, aiming to do just that, to set out um, what he's been hearing from some of you as he's been going around visiting, but trying to set out a case for science, but also to talk to him to try and get a bit of information out of him. You'll be pleased to know that, um, as we all know, he can't prejudge the outcome of the spending review, which is quite right. Um, but uh, I don't have anything particularly illuminating to share with you other than that he has been listening. Um, but I had the pleasure of regularly meeting with parliamentarians and going through the uh, airport-like security at the Houses of Parliament. Um, wonderful piece of technology and innovation that they're using there to keep themselves safe. Um, but I had the pleasure of um, meeting with many parliamentarians um, and hoping that many more of them will become champions for science from within the House. Now, um, one thing I'm cons consistently struck by is the breadth of their jobs, and I'm sure Julian can talk to you about this, but, I mean, it sounds like a terrible job. I wouldn't want it. But um, the breadth of their jobs, so when I'm meeting with them, whoever they've met with before or after will be on something entirely different that they'll have to be completely rebriefed for and know what they're talking about, hopefully. Um, so it could be from opening local farmers' markets or uh, perhaps getting to grips with council planning on a Friday back in their constituencies um, through to schools policy, foreign policy and voting on bills going through Parliament. Um, it's a tough job when done well. But these are the guys who will be making the decisions about science funding uh, in the next couple of weeks, but also in parliamentary terms to come. And one of the things I'm keen to convey to them is that science isn't another thing to add on to their list of lots of important priorities, but actually it's one of the things that underpins a lot of areas that they care about and is vital, uh, using the buzzword for tonight, it's vital to achieving many of their other aims. So whether they're interested in a stronger economy, many of them are, high value job creation, we hear that a lot, uh, environmental concerns, health improvements, um, educating young people to operate in a high-tech world, all of this growing our knowledge economy, they might care about but not recognise that they vitally important aspects of that is ensuring we've got a thriving science base in the UK. So it's not another thing to add to their list of very busy jobs, but actually something that underpins all of the things we care about. Um, you could add to that list. I'm not too sure on how the audience participation is going, so I won't ask for more, but if you have any, just throw them out of why uh, politicians need to care about it. Um, so why is it vital for government? Well, they'll find it very difficult to make much progress in any of their other aims without a thriving research base, and indeed the skilled people who are here, some of them tonight, uh, the skilled people to, that come out of a, a thriving research base. So um, it also happens to be something we're great at in the UK, thanks to many of you here. I can't say I contribute to that myself, but, um, but many of you do. And I hear again and again, including from Joe Johnson earlier, that the case for science has been made and heard. That it isn't because of a shaky evidence base that uh, science won't get the funding it needs for the long term. But in the same breath as the case has been made and heard, often the economic case, but also the social case as well for investing in science, it's been heard, but in the next breath it is... But the reality is we have committed to reducing the deficit and there isn't much spare cash going around. That's a bit of a paraphrase, but, but those two are very much held together. And that's, that's the political reality that this spending review is happening in, um, which is super exciting, I know, and not what we want to hear. But actually, that's, that's what we hear. And the reality is that they'd be completely shooting themselves in the foot if they cut science spending to achieve anything else, including a growing economy that will help them reduce the deficit as well. But... But that's the political reality any decision on science we made in. So we have a job to do, perhaps each of us in our own different ways through this evening, on social media, talking to MP, as Julian said, in making sure that um, those who are making the decisions really don't have an easy job if they want to cut science, but actually have to give it the funding it needs for long term, as we've heard. Thank you very much. Naomi Weir, Director of CASE. Uh, in the interest of balance, after Naomi, I'd like to say that audience interaction is grossly overrated. So, um, uh, we are now, for the people in the room here, we're going to have a break where you'll have a chance to stretch your legs, go to the bathroom. People watching live at home, I assume you have also had the decency to not leave your computer during the first half. You may use this opportunity as well to... Uh, Find your own refreshments. Uh, so we are only going to have uh, approximately one twelfth of an hour for the interval. So if...
Five minutes. This is why we need more science funding, people. So uh, we're going to have a very brief interval. Then we have some videos, and we're back into the second half. Can we please end with a round of applause for all the speakers you've seen so far? We'll see you in five minutes.
Ladies and gentlemen, please take your seats. Science will continue to be vital in one minute. You have one minute until we resume. One minute, please take your seats. Ladies and gentlemen, please take your seats. We are about to resume. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, please welcome back to the stage your host, Matt Parker. Yeah! Thank you very much. We have uh, some videos which are going to play. I assume we're frantically shuffling those around, so I thought I'd pop back out and say hello again. Uh, did anyone find the postcards which uh, had the, the, the value of a beer? Did anyone find them? What was that? Yes. Wow, you don't, you don't sound like someone with the excitement who just had a free Stella, I'll be honest with you. Okay, so uh, from what I can tell, there are three or fewer still available to find. Now, for uh, thanks to science and technology, not only are we, of course, being live streamed on the internet, but we were able to get a few people who very sadly were unable to make it at the last minute to our rally here, predominantly because they insisted on being in different countries at the time. One of them is off in Canada hanging out with an astronaut. And so we have uh, some videos that people have sent in. Uh, uh, ben Goldacre and Robin Ince have supplied uh, video messages, which I uh, hopefully will appear as if by magic on the screen behind me. So here we go. Hey, look, science is vital. 
And I think politicians are kind of confused, firstly, about where stuff comes from. I mean, look around you. Look around me, all of the fabrics and surfaces and materials, the, oh, the everything, the photons coming from me and going into that, and then the telegraphy and the wireless that that goes through, and then the device that you're watching it on, that all comes from science. Banking is nice, but, but fundamentally, all of the good stuff in your life, all of the modern world comes from science. And the modern world is shifting. It's changing. You know, we are... You know, we had an empire and all of that stuff, and we've got a natural advantage right now because of spectacular wealth inequality around the world. But people who invest in science, people who invest in education and research, they're the people who are going to take the big prizes in the world. And it would be nice if the UK did that. But fundamentally, it's important that someone somewhere does. And if Britain doesn't, then see you later. Fun fact, that video of Ben Goldacre was actually running at half speed. There you go. <laughs> Modern technology, what can't it do? Uh, so, uh, up next, uh, Robin Ince uh, has a uh, video, I believe, which we're going to go to. Or I have... Oh, we're ready? Okay, here we go. Right, so, ladies and gentlemen, Robin Ince. Why is science vital? Uh, pragmatically, it's vital because so many of the things around us are powered by science and technology. The scientific imagination has given us the possibility of living long lives and also in far greater comfort than most human beings have ever experienced throughout the history of humanity on the planet Earth. So it's important to know why we have the advantages we have. And of course also some of the problems that have arisen from the technology and the science we have created will only be usurped by science itself. That's also why it's vital. Imaginatively, science is vital because it illuminates you, it illuminates your picture of the universe, it gives you a greater level of understanding, sometimes for no pragmatic reason, merely for the joy of having the first little edge of understanding why your brain works as it does, why your child looks as it does, why the stars behave as they do. The idea of looking outside a window and seeing the evolution, the mutation, the heredity, natural selection that has made all the things around us and then also thinking about the counter instinctual ideas of the atoms that make us and the muons and gluons and subatomic particles which create the universe around us. All of those things to me make science vital. That's only the beginning of the list. Going racing into people who actually showed up. Up next, uh, we have a uh, material scientist uh, and award-winning author from UCL. Can you please put your hands together for Professor Mark Miodovnik? Um, I have to tell you that I was here at the last Science of the Battle Valley, and it was one of the most embarrassing moments of my life for reasons that I can tell you later in the pub. Um, but it did involve lots of people standing up and chanting. And I, at the time, I was unable to give a talk that really kind of responded to that. And I thought, this time, I'm going to do it. OK. So I'm going to need you to chant. I am, really. Otherwise, this will be the second most embarrassing. Or perhaps it will even eclipse the other most embarrassing moment of my life, which really, truly was embarrassing. And there is proof on the internet about it. So, um, will you promise to chant when he gets the bit about the Tories? Would you just promise me that? Will you promise to stand up and chant? I'm gonna need you to do this, otherwise embarrassment is going to ensue. Okay, but you haven't got to do it for a bit. You, you, you can relax for a moment, just listen to my, my words. Okay, well don't just listen, I'm kind of getting enraged. But first of all, become intrigued. Okay, first, okay. So here we're going to start off. There were, last week, in the last few weeks, announced thousands of engineering jobs lost in the steel industry. 
Now, you may not care about these. It's not may not be something close to your heart, but let me tell you, it's close to my heart. The steel industry is the backbone of this country. Really, the Industrial Revolution was spurred by the birth of this industry, and it's still, it's still what keeps this country going. And if you don't believe me, let me tell you that everything in this room, including your clothes, including your chairs, including all this stuff, all of this stuff was made using steel tools. All of this stuff is made using steel. We are a steel making and using world, a civilization absolutely based on steel. And if you think, well, I'll admit, all these jobs are going, clearly it's an industry in decline. We don't have to worry about it. There are more high tech industries. Let me tell you, there's 20,000 people in this country who are makers of steel. 20,000 people who've got that cleverness, that innovative ability to make this stuff. I mean, and real stuff that makes all of this, all of this stuff around us. And that's real material wealth. And it's not to be sniffed at, and it's not to be discarded. And, you know, these are 20,000 innovative, clever people who are able to survive for tens of years in a global market where people in China, people in America, people in Japan are making this stuff too. And they're trying to make it faster and better and cleverer, and we are still holding our own. That's really impressive. And although, yeah, we've lost thousands of jobs in the last few weeks, there are still 20,000 people who've got those skills. And they're going to be here in 10 years. They're going to be here in 20 years. They're going to be making the steel for us so that we can use it, so we can build all this infrastructure. And where, you ask, I can hear you asking, thinking, where did these people come from? I don't know them. These people, these people came from hundreds of years of investment. And in the last 20, 30, 40 years, the government continually invested in material science research to keep this country at the forefront of all of those innovations. So every time another country came up with a new thing, we were there, we were there before them. And that, that is what keeps the steel industry going. That's why we can all be happy living in Britain, because we have the steel makers. We know how to make this stuff that is fundamental to our lives. So it's people like people in Sheffield, people in Manchester, this massive steel industry there, Glasgow, York, Newcastle, all of these places, Leeds. These places make stuff, and it's really important stuff. But that doesn't... It doesn't, you can't just suddenly stop investing and hope that those industries are going to survive because it isn't the industries that need investing in, it's the people. You've got to develop those clever people. You've got to develop the talent. And that is where funding science and engineering in universities and the research base comes in. It takes 20 years of investment in someone, in a person who starts out as a 15, 16, 17 year old, doesn't know what they want to do, goes to university, thinks, my God, material science is the most interesting thing in the world. I don't know why people are studying astrophysics um, or biology. Uh, those people, yes, you know who I'm talking about. Now look, these people, you know, they need tens of years before they come up with the next idea, before they come up with an industry that can survive these global turbulences. And these industries have to put up with, yeah, they have to put up with people dumping cheap material onto the market. They have to put up with the sterling being suddenly strong one, one year and weak the next year. They have to put up with, with energy prices in this country fluctuating wildly. And they still manage to make this stuff for us. It's really impressive. But it won't be around in 20 years' time. That whole industry, all of these people, all of that kind of that heritage will go if we start doing what we're currently doing, which is not investing in science and engineering. We're just not investing enough. And we've got, we've got to stop that. So there is some chanting that needs to be done about this. And I want to just say this. It makes absolutely no economic sense to decrease the amount of science and engineering funding in these young people, in these innovative industries. It makes absolutely no economic sense to do that. So and I need you to help me on this one. I say to the Tories, don't be economically illiterate by cutting the funding to science and engineering. So I say to the Tories, <laughs> thank you. There's more, yes. 
So I say to the Tories, don't be economically literate by giving certain a flat cash settlement. That's a cut in real terms. So I say to the Tories, no flat cash settlement. No flat cash settlement. No flat cash settlement. It makes no sense. So I say to the Tories, don't be economically illiterate and give science and engineering a small increase in funding. Because that's not what our major competitors are doing. That's not what Germany is doing. That's not what the US is doing. That's not what Japan is doing. So I say to the Tories, don't give a little tiny increase to Sun. Come on. So I say to the Tories, no tiny increase. No tiny increase. What I really want the Tories to hear, and I want you all to say, I want them not to be economically illiterate. I want them not to jeopardize all of our futures, including their own, by the way. I want them to raise the science and engineering budget to 3% of the GDP of this country. 3% of the GDP is what we need. <laughs> and that's the only way to keep Great Britain great. Thank you all. Mark me a Dominic, ladies and gentlemen. I think you all did a sterling job cheering. That was very, very good. In fact, I think, unlike last Science's Vital Rally, that's barely going to make the top 10 most embarrassing moments of Mark's life. Uh, so, up next, we have uh, the Cancer Research UK Campaigns Ambassador. Can you put your hands together for Sue Duncombe? Well, first of all, I don't have the scientific credentials nor the intellectual humour of my fellow presenters. But what I share with everyone here this evening is an absolute passion for continued government investment in UK science. The economic argument is absolutely irrefutable, but my passion stems from a more personal experience, and I'll now share that with you. Back in early 2005, my husband Philip, who appeared extremely fit and healthy through a routine test, was diagnosed with prostate cancer. The good news was it was believed that the cancer had been caught at an early stage. The bad news, it was a particularly aggressive tumour. And at that stage, we had mixed emotions. On one side, we had hope, and on the other side, we had fear. But Philip underwent surgery with curative intent, and for a year, everything was really, really good. And then in the routine test, after 12 months, we discovered that the cancer had spread. And in Philip's words, the genie had obviously got out of the bottle before he'd undergone surgery. At that stage, we knew there wasn't a cure, but there were drugs that were available, that should prolong his life, and particularly importantly, maintain his quality of life. So for the next couple of years, we were on the roller coaster journey that many cancer patients and their families endure. The highs are when you're on a treatment and it's effective and you feel really good. The lows, when that treatment stops working and you worry about what else is in the cupboard to actually treat you in the future? And for us, the dreaded day came in autumn 2008 when the clinicians said the chemotherapy stopped working, so we're going to stop that treatment. But worse than that, there are no licensed drugs left in the cupboard. That was the absolute low of the roller coaster. And by Christmas 2008, Philip really wasn't well. His PSA was increasing exponentially. 
his quality of life was such that he wasn't well enough for us to go and stay with um, friends overnight who lived nearby. But there was hope. And thankfully, in January 2009, Philip was enrolled in a study for a new drug, abiraterone. The impact of that drug was absolutely fantastic. So first of all, after two weeks, his PSA had halved compared to pretreatment levels. After three weeks, his quality of life was so good that he was researching flights to Cape Town. And actually, we managed to cue image. We managed to actually get 10 days in between clinic visits in South Africa where we had an absolutely fantastic time with friends. It was a really, really special holiday because before that, as I said, I didn't think we were even going to stay at a friend's house down the road. And throughout that year, we had an opportunity to do more things. So in July, we were te teaching some friends how how to sail in Greece. It was just absolutely stunning, the difference that abiraterone made to our lives. Unfortunately, abiraterone eventually stopped working, and Philip sadly died on Christmas Day 2009. But he'd had at least 10 months of additional quality time to spend with friends and family. And it wasn't just Philip that benefited from abiraterone, but all of us around him benefited. Abiraterone was actually made available to men in the UK in 2012. And what that meant is for other men who had prostate cancer, for whom the cupboard would have previously been bare, they now had another option. And hopefully that would also allow them to spend quality time with friends and family. Abiraterone was discovered by Cancer Research UK in the Cancer Therapeutics Centre in London's Institute of Cancer Research UK. It was funded by Cancer Research UK, by industry, and by government in terms of its development. But it's not just specific projects that government funding supports. Government provides the vital infrastructure to research to, for research to take place in universities and hospitals in this country. In addition, they train scientists and clinicians. And the benefits that we get from that research are not just in terms of identifying new drugs, but in terms of identifying lifestyle factors that can actually help prevent cancer, on new ways of delivering radiotherapy, or in doing surgery. Cancer Research UK's ambition is that cancer survival will be increased from the current situation of two in four patients surviving cancer to three out of four patients surviving in 20 years' time. But to actually realise that ambition, there needs to be research. And that's why I'm calling on government to actually protect UK science, continue investment in the science budget, because it's investment now that will save lives in the future. Thank you. You don't come, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you, Sue, for a very personal story which uh, reminds us, uh, as, as well as, of course, the uh, economic arguments for science research, the sobering thought that so much personal suffering can be avoided if we have more research 
in science. So uh, please, if you have a story to share, uh, like Sue did, the, uh, the postcard is a fantastic uh, way to get that straight to the people in government who are making these decisions about changes in spending. So if you can go on the uh, website and fill out a postcard, do, or just to support, of course, uh, as much research as possible. And uh, such is the nature of science, and indeed our evening uh, tonight, that we run the entire spectrum of reasons why we do science in the first place. The very very important reasons to make our lives uh, better and have a higher quality of life, right through to simply sating human curiosity. And uh, so to remind us of the, the fun side of why we do science, just because we are curious creatures, we have to engage your brains. Uh, you may have seen him online. He does the YouTube Brit Lab channel uh, on YouTube as well as many others. You may have seen him doing science spots on Blue Peter. You may have seen him as one of Mark Miodovnik's ill-advised hype people in the background a second ago. Can you please welcome to the stage, Greg Foote. Um, absolute pleasure to be here. Um, I remember being at one of the rallies in 2010 and uh, feeling the passion of the speakers and, and the audience, and it's very much the same tonight. Kind of, you can really kind of feel it back there as well. So, um, well done, you guys. Um, so, to me, I kind of see UK science as being made out of kind of three groups: those doing the science, doing the research, and helping that happen; those people applying those ideas in a whole way, shape, and form; and those people that are getting that message out there and helping helping communicate it. And I'm very much in that that third group. I'm a full-time science communicator. That's that is that is my job, uh, and it gives me the opportunity to do some amazing things. I've gone on to Blue Peter, as Matt said, and, and made giant vats of custard and got Radzi to run across it. I've uh, been on Sunday brunch doing jelly brain dissections and all sorts of things. Um, recently been doing a whole host of YouTube work with some amazing scientists, one of which I got the opportunity to go volcano chasing in Japan, which was kind of cool. Um, but that is not the reason why I do this job. That is not why I go out and, and talk about science with people. For me, I see science communication as a way to introduce the public to a scientific, evidence-based way of thinking, to start a conversation that gives them the tools and allows them to understand the science that is relevant to them so that they can make their own decisions about issues like GM or vaccination or, or nuclear power. But also, for me, science communication, science, is a way of sparking an audience's curiosity to invoke that sense of wonder, to encourage them to ask questions and find out good answers. So Jenny asked me along to do a few experiments, a few demos with you guys. So uh, Andrew, can you bring on the first one? Yes, thank you, sir. So uh, we're going to start with an easy question for you. This is how this is going to begin. So two balloons, they are identical. I've just inflated this one. It's, that's what I've been doing for the last half hour. Uh, this one's obviously a lot smaller than this one. There's a valve here that allows the air to flow across and between the two. All right? So, easy question to start with. When I open the valve, what's going to happen? Make your prediction. You ready? You have to, let's do a countdown for three. Let's get like audience participation. It's, it's a really big moment. Three, two, one. Science takes time, guys. Come on. We know this. Can we see what's happening? Who thought that they were going to go the same size? And I've been asking people backstage, and they thought it was going to go the same size. Okay. That's the vast majority of you. All right. So let's try to figure out why this happened, why the opposite of what the majority of you uh, thought would happen happened. So what happens when you blow up a balloon? Easy questions to start with. What happens when you blow up a balloon? It gets bigger. What are you actually doing to the latex of the balloon? You're stretching it. Okay. And then when you let go of it, what happens? The air rushes out with that great fart noise. And that's because the latex is pushing down. It's exerting a pressure on the air and it's, and it's firing out. But of course, we had two stretch balloons and a passage between the two. So then the question is, why did the air flow that way? Now, if you're at the side of a train track, you're told to stand a step back behind the yellow line. And that's because when the train rushes through, what feeling do you get? What happens to you? Okay, someone said sucked in. Now, 
we know that you're not getting sucked in. But it's that feeling of getting sucked in. Because what's happened is the, the train is rushing past. It's making all the air move super quick. That's at low pressure. Around you is air at a lot higher pressure. And that's essentially pushing you in. So things like to move from areas of high pressure to low pressure. Got it. Now, when you blow a balloon up, is it harder at the start or harder towards the end? At the start, now this is, what, this is kind of the intuitive leap. When you blow up a balloon at the start, that is the, the point where it is under the, the most amount of pressure because you're stretching those molecules right at the start. That is why this smaller balloon is at a higher pressure than this one. Now I know that's not going to be a good enough excuse for most people in here because you're all scientists and you're nerds like me. So let's do some maths. I'm going to do this super quickly. So for those of you who hate that sort of stuff... Don't worry about it. It's only going to be over in a minute. So uh, pressure, it's all about pressure, we've said. So pressure is force divided by area. So if we think about a little cut through one of these balloons, the force is essentially like you've stretched a spring. So the force is going to be proportional to the amount of stretch, so essentially the radius. So if we double the radius, you double the force. What about the area? Now, if we're looking at a disk, it's going to be pi r squared. But the thing is, if you double the radius, that's going to times it by 4 so we're essentially going to have a double divided by a times four, so that's eventually going to half. So if you double the size of the balloon, you're going to half the pressure. So that is why a smaller balloon is at a higher pressure than a lower balloon, the bigger balloon. Okay, good. You, you managed to work that out. Good, nice. Andrew! <laughs> now, I've got a quick one for you, and this was just kind of mocked up in, uh, in the workshop the other day. So here we go. I was doing this with uh, Simon Singh's kid earlier. And Simon's face was a picture. Um, what do I have in this bottle? I have two beads. What can you tell me about the relationship between the two beads? Who said the blue ones are heavier? Who said that? For that person, think about dropping a bowling ball in the sea versus dropping a ship into the sea. The bowling ball weighs less, it has less mass, but yet the ship floats. So it's about volume, the amount of water, the amount of liquid that it's displacing as well. So it's actually about density. So the more accurate thing to say would be to say that these are more dense than these one at the top. Technically, you're right, because they actually take up the same volume. But, uh, you know, let's not, let's not be picky. So, so we can say that these blue beads here are denser than the liquid, and these white beads here are less dense than the liquid. That's why those ones sunk and those ones floated. But now something weird's happening. Now, I'm not going to explain this one. I'm going to leave you guys to ponder it. If you've worked it out, don't yell it out. Let people make their own discovery in their head on the way home as you start to ponder what must be going on inside this bottle. So, for me, science is all about curiosity. I don't work in science anymore, but it still massively captivates me, and I get to go and speak to audiences about science. So, if George, if George Osborne decides to cut the science budget, for me, he's essentially cutting the source and the salve of curiosity. Thanks very much. Uh oh, uh oh. No, 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 no. I was going no. and now Andrea's heckling. No. Well, it's yeah, it was totally a metaphor. Look, Cheers, look. Andrea. Sir, I don't know who you are <laughs> or how you got in here. <laughs> <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, Andrea, Greg Foot! For those of you who know Professor Andrea Seller at the back, uh, you, like me, will have assumed his complaint was, excuse me, none of that was dangerous enough. So, I mean, frankly, I thought that's the most fun you can possibly have with latex and tubing anyway. Um, up next, you must be worried that we, we haven't checked in on the other locations for a while, and it went so well last time. We're going to do it again. So here we go. We're going we're gonna to throw live to, have we got, oh, here we got the first ones up. What's that? One of our huge science's vital screens. Has someone leaning against it? <laughs> Is that one metric human for scale? Is that what? Okay, there you are. So they, they've been watching Mark uh, in Larger Than Life. Uh, live link up. 
What could possibly go wrong? Well, there you are. So where's the bar? Glasgow. <laughs> This is great. I'm, I'm crowdsourcing the jokes. Uh, uh, hoverboards. Yes, we are all still very bitter about that. The end. So, no, wait. Oh, here we go. We're under the... Wow, that was quick. My goodness. Who is that? Rez. Congratulations. Here we go. First heckle of the night. I thought you were going to heckle why that was up there for we all have a good recursive laugh. Anyway, here we go. Wow, so Greg's, Greg's balloons really were the most popular part of the evening. Uh, and okay, and oh, here we go. I'm back to the whole excitement. Right, so there you are. Everyone else uh, is having as much fun as we are. So uh, we are dangerously close to the very end of the evening. Uh, uh, the fantastic people from Science is Vital will be back at the very end of the show just to wrap everything up and to tell you what you can do after that. Before that, we have two final speakers who are going to come out and talk to you about why they think science is important. Up next is a professor of physics. Uh, in fact, a space scientist who researches the sun at UCL. Can you please put your hands together for Professor Lucy Green? Thank you. Thank you, and good evening, everybody. So, yes, it is a pleasure to be here to talk to you um, about some of my personal views about the funding of space science and the reason why we should continue funding space science. Jenny asked that we give you a few snippets of things that are important to us, and, and I was reflecting, thinking, I've been a space scientist for over 15 years now, and luckily, there have been so many great missions and so many great stories to tell you about, but I think the most thrilling one for me was one that happened at the end of last year. I was on a train to York, about to go and give a talk about solar physics, but I was monitoring Twitter at the same time because, as you've already heard from Helen, we had little Philae was about to land on, Cor on Comet 67P. And it was thrilling to be able to watch this happen. After a journey of 12 years through space and many, many more years before that of the design, the build, and the test of the spacecraft as well, Philae finally successfully landed. And Rosetta is still around that comet right now making its observations. Um, and I think that's a really important point to say that we need really long-term stable funding in order to be able to do these amazing things. And it really was amazing. It was watched around the world by millions of people. What better demonstration can we have than that, that the public are inspired by space science? And it was a European Space Agency mission. I can't tell you how happy that made me. After many years of working on NASA projects, it was great to know that Europe was up there doing this. But not only that, it was the UK going to a comet because our instrumentation was on board and we also have instrumentation on Rosetta as well. But we're not stopping with comet Churyumov Gerasimenko. Thank you. I <laughs> was learning that for a long time. Um, so we're not stopping with this comet. Where are we going next? Well, at the moment, myself and my colleagues are working on a mission called Solar Orbiter. It will be launched in 2018, and it's another incredibly ambitious project to go to the sun. It will orbit very close in, and it will look at how the sun creates and, cre and controls something that we call the heliosphere. Now, this is another long-term mission. We've been working on it for many years. It takes three years to get to the right orbit, another three years to slowly track up to be able to see over the poles of the sun, and that's just really the start of the science that it will be doing. And I'm really proud to say that of the 10 instruments on board, four have a major contribution from UK scientists. Then there's also ExoMars. The same year that we launched Solar Orbiter, we'll be sending a European rover to land on the Red Planet. Europe's going there and we'll be sending its rover. Now, these missions cost millions of pounds collectively, but it is money that's incredibly well spent. As well as having the scientific return, this money comes back to the UK to fund engineers, to build the projects and design the missions. And also, I should say that it goes to industry as well as academia. So as an example, we have Airbus UK, who are both building the spacecraft for Solar Orbiter and the rover that will land on the surface of Mars. But being involved gives us a seat at the table and it allows us to do the science that the UK wants us to do. But the reasons we can do this are also something that's close to my heart. Having worked at UCL for so long, which was the first university in the UK to do space research. The reason we're able to go out and explore the solar system, 
the reason we're able to have such leadership is because we have been doing this since 1957. That was our first rocket launch, the same year that Sputnik 1 went up. In 1962, the UK had its first satellite, Aerial 1, and it's gone on and on since then. And it's not just about the science in the academic context. What we've learned has created a whole space industry in the UK that employs 37,000 people directly and has a £10 billion a year turnover. And this is something that the government wants to quadruple over the coming years. They see the potential for the economy. But it's more than that. Space has a really important value for the public. It does public good. It gives us weather forecasting, communications, broadcasting, and it gives the UK national prestige. So I want to say, let's continue this journey together. We need the funding for the long term so that my students can go on and make the most of the missions that we are setting up for them today. Thank you. Professor Lucy Green, ladies and gentlemen. And finally, our last speaker for this evening, you may recognize his voice as the host of Inside Science on BBC Radio 4. Can you please put your hands together for Dr. Adam Rutherford? Is this my clicker? Good, thank you. Hello, everyone. I'm last, and then we're going to the pub. So let's do this quickly. Um, Thank you to Andrew and Jenny and Stephen for organizing this and putting us on a war footing because this is a conflict and this is serious. We've heard from everyone tonight. We've heard the data. We've heard the passion. We've heard the expertise. I don't really have anything else to add to that, quite frankly. I, I was, uh, uh, you know, I've, my, I've got a column in The Observer and that on Sunday is, is going to be about this, so you can read my thoughts there. That's fine, just to do that. Um, uh, you hear about how passionate I am about science every week on Radio 4. And in three weeks' time, Joe Johnson is going to be on my program. <laughs> Thank you, Andrew. Um, and, and I need you to tell me all of those stats over again so I can put them to him. If you have a question, then you can tweet it or you can email the program, bbcinsidescience at bbc.co.uk. That was my Radio 4 voice, by the way. Um, so I, I was... Uh, I had this sort of big grandstanding five minute speech, I've only got five minutes, and I was rehearsing it, I was thinking about what I was gonna say and all the passion and all the data. I was having my hair cut today and I was thinking, oh, bugger all that. And I was staring at myself in the mirror and thinking about hair and thinking about science. And then um, th this, this image came to, into my mind. <laughs> I, I was thinking about science, I was thinking about hair, and, and this of course is, um, Brian Cox in 1992, <laughs> when he was a member of the band uh, Dare, which was uh, the band he was in before D-Ream. And I was thinking about this image, and I, I literally wrote this speech on the bus on the way down here, so forgive me if the data is a little bit shoddy. But I was thinking about science, and I was thinking about hair, and this image came into my, into my mind. And then this image came into my mind. So that is also Brian Cox. Um, when he was going through his, uh, I don't know, Bonnie Tyler or maybe <laughs> Julia Roberts phase. And there I was, I was thinking about science and I was thinking about hair and suddenly something clicked in my head. This is a correlation. This was when he was in a band, a successful musician. And then after that, he became a scientist, a publicly funded research scientist. And we all know what his hair is, is now like. So I went through some of the, I went through a list of, uh, well, a very short list because it was a, just a bus ride, but I went through a list of some of the prominent male science communicators in this country. Now, unfortunately, both Simon Singh and um, Jim Alkaleli have left, and Ben Goldeck didn't stick around, but perhaps if I could have the next slide. So that was, that was Simon when he was at CERN in 1993. Now, he, he does, ha his haircut hasn't changed radically since then, but you, you can see he has lost a, a proportion of his hair since the mid-90s. Andrew, next slide. So that was Ben at the last Science's Vital ra Rally in 2010. I think he was going through his Bob Dylan phase at that point. Now, I was backstage, so I didn't actually see him on video, but I'm assuming his hair was less voluminous than it is there. Is that correct? No? Well, I'm choosing to ignore that data. Um, 
because I am scientist. Uh, so that, that, that was Ben. And then the next slide. So who's that? <laughs> Who is that beautiful, handsome young man aged, <laughs> aged 19 in 1982? Not me. I'm not that old. That's Jim al -Kaleli. That is Jim al -Kaleli when he was a second year, an undergraduate. Look how handsome he is. I have said this to his face, and I would say it to his face. It's just a shame. He had to leave. Anyway, so I was thinking, well, you know, there's a, there seems to be some sort of relationship between volume of hair and length of time in academia. <laughs> So I plotted it. Now, as I said, these are preliminary results. Um, and um, as I understand it, correlation and uh, causation, well, I don't really understand those things at all, actually. But I, I think, I, I think the uh, x-axis is um, volume of hair relative to 100% starting in 1990. As I said, the, the data does need working on to, to some degree. But there you've got Jim descending to 2005, where he is as bald as a coot. Simon flatlines round about 2000 and, and just has hair on the top of his head. I, I, I understand that that is a choice. <laughs> There's Brian. Brian goes from 100% actually up as, as he joins D. Ream and, and that has descended to um, the sort of Beatles foppish hair that, that we know and love. Ben also went up according to my data in about 2010 and there's now, well, that, that, that end points, we're okay with that based on the video? Yeah, okay. Anyway, <laughs> so I didn't see it, so it doesn't count, uh, as is my understanding of causation and correlation. And um, so then I plotted the science budget over the last, uh, the, the last 20 years on top of this. Is that roughly accurate, Andrew? You're, you're, the, you're the stato in, in this? So um, there you go. I mean, there is a, you know, we can save science for the number of reasons that have been outlined uh, tonight, because it builds economies, because uh, it is uh, the generator of wealth, demonstrably so, and because science is interesting and anyone who disagrees can just uh, fuck off, really. Um, <laughs> But let's really campaign to protect the science budget, lest we all end up like Jim. That is all. I'll see you in the pub. <laughs>
Thank you. Thank you very much. And thank you all for coming. And thank you to our wonderful speakers for you know, a truly wonderful evening we've had tonight. Jenny and I are not going to delay you much further before we go to the pub. But I just wanted to say uh, that Britain is a funny country. And you know, we British are a funny people uh, to go with it. We really don't like to blow our own trumpet. It's a, a funny thing about us, but except perhaps occasionally. And one of those occasions, I think, that sticks in my mind is in 2012, when the Olympics came to London. And not only did we have a glorious opening ceremony choreographed by Danny Boyle, which I think celebrated some of the actual, the really great, with a small g, things about Britain. The things that this country does fantastically well. The NHS, the Industrial Revolution, and science is one of the things that we do fantastically well as well. So Team GB did brilliantly in 2012. But if there was Olympics in science, then year after year, the UK would be a gold medal winner. We really are world class at science, and we really ought to be shouting about it. It's something that I think we don't celebrate enough. And we really should celebrate it because it enriches the time that we have on Earth. And we need to invest in it because it enriches our economy and helps to drive the productivity that we're so desperately lacking and that we need to pull out of the current situation. So come on, George Osborne. Flat cash simply isn't good enough. It's lacking the ambition that Britain deserves. And we need positive reinvestment to build up the fantastic science base that we have. So on the 25th of November, we will all be looking very closely at what you do. No more Dr. Nice Guy. We all have to be a bit more yank about this, I think. <laughs> okay. You're a Brit now. I, I know. <laughs> anyway, it only remains for me to say to thank you for coming, and also I must dispense the most important information of the evening, which is where the party will car carry on. I'm reliably informed that the Enterprise Pub, which is, uh, as you leave the building, you, there's a really scary-looking dark alley on your left. <laughs> Trust me. <laughs> if you just go down there, apparently there's a lovely pub called The Enterprise where many of us will be directly after this meeting. I also want to please urge you to send a postcard to George Osborne if you don't want to bother with the online widget. Take one of the blank ones on your chair. Scribble it. Scribble on it right now, those pens. Give it uh, to Marianne at the back who's wearing the white lab coat, looking very geeky and chic. Um, please, uh, however you do it, please tell George why you think science is vital and why science needs to be invested in, in the future. That's it. Have a great night, and science is vital as ever. Uh All right, science is vital. Don't forget that. Now, one.